Well, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Good evening, good evening. Erev Tov. Hey, do me a huge favor. Stand up, cross the aisle, introduce yourself to somebody you've never met. Ask them their favorite color and give them a hearty Shabbat Shalom hug. What's your favorite color? Blue. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Well, we want to welcome you to Tree of Life tonight. Tree of Life, you know it's first mentioned in the scriptures, right? In the center of the paradise of Eden. But we know it was soon lost to humanity on account of Adam's transgression. Nahon. In the book of Revelation, though, it's back. It's resurrected. On the account of the faithful obedience of Yeshua. Mankind's last Adam. Aren't you grateful for that? The tree of life is resurrected. In the book of Proverbs, the tree of life is a metaphor for chokhmah, for the life of wisdom. And so we appreciate you being out here tonight. Appreciate those logging on on FriendPile or Facebook and YouTube as well. We know that you have a lot of questions. We're here as a Messianic Jewish community to hopefully answer all of your questions tonight. We know that you're Visit with us will be a memorable one. It will be a positive one as well. The Shema is the prayer of our people. It is spoken of. It is the anthem of our people. It is the declaration of our faith. And we recite it twice every day. And so this will be the final time today we recite the Shema, the Pledge of Allegiance to our one God. Let's express it back to him with much kavanah, with intention. From Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and forward. Please join with me. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Mahal Huto Le Olam Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the glorious name of his glorious kingdom, which is forever and ever. Amen. 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 April. Amen. Well, let's worship Adonai tonight. Amen. Let's lift our voices as loud as we can with a shout of praise because he is good and he is worthy of all praise and honor and adoration. Amen. my eyes to the hills where does my help come from my help comes from from the lord hallelujah i lift up my eyes to the hills where does my help come from my help comes from from the lord hallelujah hallelujah Yeshua, Yeshua, Mashiach, Mashiach, Yeshua, Yeshua, Mashiach. 
you this evening. We give you praise because God, you are greater than all of our circumstances. You are worthy of our praise. God, even in the midst of darkness, we can stand with the firm foundation that you are there, that you are our strength, that we can stand and be secure in the knowledge that you are the lion of Judah, that you are the soon and coming king. So, Father, we give you worship and praise this evening. We're going to do a new song this evening. It's called The Lion of Judah. And as I was thinking and considering and praying about this song, I kept coming back to this line in the the movie Chronicles of Narnia, 
when Susan says to Mr. to the beaver, she says, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? And Beaver says to her, he says, safe? Who said anything about it's safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And that's what I kept thinking about is that in our walk, sometimes the things that we have to go through in order to fully pursue him it, with everything within us, it doesn't feel safe. It shakes us to our very core. It rattles this, the, those things that we thought were sure foundations. But it is all for his glory and for his good. Amen? And so in Revelation it says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He has triumphed. Amen? Amen. Into the throne room we stand in awe Before the one who hears our call Hoshiana to the King Angels and elders bow down to you All creation cries out your name Hoshiana to the King Hoshiana, Hoshiana, you're the lion of Judah, the great I am, seated on the throne, the God of Israel. The Lion of Judah, the Great I Am, seated on the throne, the God of Israel. Into the throne room we stand in awe, for the one who hears our call, Hoshiana to the down to you. All creation cries out your name. Hoshiana to the King. Hoshiana. Hoshiana.
king of kings, there is no god before him. There is none like him. Colors everywhere, and 
him up tonight. He is Adonai Rofecha. He is the God that heals us. Amen. God is healing people in this room even tonight. From back pain, neck pain. He's healing emotionally from relationship fractures. He's bringing some things back into alignment tonight. Not because we say it, because he's a good God. He desires reconciliation. He desires 
restoration. He desires healing. It's in his wings. Amen. Well, you may be seated with your fine selves tonight. <laughs> this service reminds me, you can stay up here April, a little bit, of Hanukkah 2020. I remember we were having an evening service and another bout of COVID had happened and the mall was trying to put the kibosh on people meeting in the mall and, and we were determined to meet. It was Hanukkah and I get a call in the afternoon and oh, we've got no water in the building, Rabbi Joel, no water in the building. And so we went, sprung into action, got a couple of porta potties out here on the patios, and we just had service. So tonight, we've got no sinks, but we have hand sanitizer for you in the restrooms. I'm just going to give myself some hand sanitizer. So how many of you know we need to be flexible in the Messianic movement? We're not highly funded. We have problems, electrical plumbing, and those are going to be our problems in about three weeks, by the way. If you heard the announcement here last week, you can go on the app and re-listen to that. If you weren't here, we so appreciate that. Turn in your scriptures quickly to the book of Psalms, chapter 5 tonight. Verse 13, David writes the following. For you bless the righteous, Adonai, you surround him with favor as a shield. You know, when you and I think of God's favor, some of us anyway think of him supporting and promoting the endeavors in life toward a successful conclusion. But as David points out here, favor is actually a two-sided coin, isn't it? Not only does the Lord promote our endeavors, but equally important, he protects us from the people and circumstances that would try to come against us to harm us and to destroy us. God's favor, my friends, is a truly priceless benefit in our lives to be thankfully acknowledged and not take it for granted. Listen, if this is your first time here tonight, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Raise your hand. I want to put a free book into your hand tonight. We so appreciate you being with us. First or second time here, I want to put this book into your hands. It'll give you a quick primer of the vision of Messianic Judaism, why we do what we do here at Tree of Life. Thank you so much for being here. And why don't we look to the Lord in prayer right now in his word for these offerings and God's tithe. Alvino Malkano, our father and our king, we thank you tonight. Lord, even if our plumbing's a little bit amiss tonight, we are here as mishpucha, as family, celebrating your goodness, celebrating the resurrection power of Yeshua HaMashiach in our lives tonight. And we're grateful for that. We're grateful, Lord, as we transition into 100% occupancy in this facility in a couple of weeks, that you're going to meet every need, Lord, in this place, every financial need, every emotional, every spiritual need, whatever is needed, Lord, we are putting our feet on the water. We're going to walk on that water, Lord, because we believe, Lord, you have a vision and a mission for us, a greater one than we've ever had here in San Diego and beyond. So, Lord, we bow our faces before you tonight, knowing that you are the provider in our lives, and we trust you for it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, gentlemen. God is good. You can make a tax-deductible gift out to Tree of Life. You can scan to give on the app at your seats. Take that out for a moment. You can see our brochures in there. You can take out the prayer request postcard in there. We really pray here at Tree of Life, and we desire and, and covet to, to pray for you and with you for anything going on that you need prayer for. Take out your bulletins quickly. I want to highlight a couple of things in your bulletin. We had a wonderful guys breakfast this morning. Guys, if you were not there, sorry, you missed out on some incredible stuff. But we know you're busy, so we're going to periodically do this. Next Sunday afternoon, there is a, uh, a women's luncheon at Sheila Nager's home as well. And you definitely uh, want to avail yourself to that beginning at 2 p.m. Uh, take the children, get a babysitter, bring a salad and a dessert to share. More info will be in the app in the water well section. August 28th, two weeks from Sunday, we're going to have an annual Messianic picnic at, uh, with, at De Anza Cove with our sister congregation, Kehilat Ariel in Claremont. We're going to have a time of Tivila, a time of immersion as well there. So if you desire to be immersed, please see me after the service. And we're going to have a surprise for you as well on Immersion Day. 
You take a look at all of our high holy day schedule. Our beginning Hebrew starts after Labor Day, is right before Labor Day. All the schedule is in there. I want to uh, play a couple of videos toward that effect to get us caught up on everything. Guys, we have the Shabbat School uh, ministry video. We need some help, and here's how we need it. Here's the thing. I can't volunteer in kids' ministry. I take care of my own kids all day. I'm already tithing. What else do they want from me? Kids just don't get me. I don't know anything about the Bible. I am not a juice and crackers man. My kids are already grown up. I can't sing. I can't carry a tune. I volunteered last decade. I need less stress in my life. I'm allergic to glitter. Kids are gross. I don't have enough vacation days. Let's be honest, you know what I'm teaching your kids. My weekends are for the golf course. Look, we've heard it all before. So cut this away and sign up for kids ministry. I think God's calling me to the park lot ministry. Listen, we're giving you one more week to pray about that. And Kat Marquardt, who's going to be back with us, uh, has been heading up our kids' ministry in the interim. Uh, she wants to meet with you after the service. By the way, we're transitioning back to morning service next week. We've had a good time in the evening, but we're going back to 10 a.m. next Saturday. If that's you and you want to serve at any level of kids' ministry, or maybe you just want to kind of wade out a little bit in the water, see what it's about, see Kat after the service next Shabbat morning. We have a work day coming up. Guys, you have a JPEG on that. We can kind of show that. October, it's in your bulletin, October the 16th. I'm not sure we're going to get to that date with the things that are happening around here, with things happening in our restrooms and stuff. But we are going to have a congregational work day from 8 a.m. to 3, and then we're going to follow it with a barbecue. These are going to be turnkey projects. We're going to highlight and figure out the most uh, the prioritization of all that needs to be done in this facility, as it'll be ours, 100% occupancy. And so come out. That'll be on a Sunday, October 18th. 16th, excuse me. I wanted to um, highlight one other item, and then I want to introduce some special guests to you tonight. Maybe we have that next slide for the, the Tuesday nights. Do we have a slide for that? Yes, 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 yes. Following my extended explanation to you last Saturday night of what's happening here concerning this facility transitioning into our hands, 100% beginning September 1st, our praise and worship team practice is going to move from Tuesday nights to Thursday nights, beginning on that day. And that will allow us to do some different things here in the facility on Tuesday nights moving forward over the next couple of years until this facility lease is out. And so toward that end, I've tentatively titled these meetings on Tuesday night, beginning at 7 o'clock, Torah and Tefillah Tuesdays. What does that mean? Teaching or instruction, Torah and prayer, Tefillah. And it's going to start at 7 o'clock sharp with a 45 to 60 minute teaching, followed by about 15 or 20 minutes of congregational prayer, ladies and guys together. We've been praying separately for the past year and a half. We're going to bring it all together. And I wanted to title these meetings, actually, in my heart, I wanted to title them Tacos, Torah, and Tefillah Tuesdays, but I didn't want to commit anybody, like Victor, or anybody in the group to take on that responsibility, but I'm sure that might happen, so we'll let you know. Thank you. And we want to get that phone call as well. In any event, our first set of Torah and Tefillah Tuesdays uh, will consist of a four-session seminar focused on best practices in leadership that I will be teaching, a topic that might not sound very appealing or appetizing to you, but I believe it is applicable for all of us in our journey of Talmidut, of discipleship, a goal, the goal of which is multiplication. Let me explain why I believe this set of teachings is critical for all of us to take advantage of. As I was praying about this during the week, I was reminded of Yeshua's words when he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he may send out workers into his harvest field. My friends, how can we be effective laborers in this end time harvest? And I believe the best practices necessary to be an effective laborer and by implication an effective leader are the very same things necessary to be an effective Talmud, a disciple. 
There are three things that are modeled by our predecessors in Scripture, the Shalachim, that cause them to be effective Talmidim, effective laborers and effective leaders in the harvest that they were appointed to. Go with me in your Scriptures to the book of Acts, chapter 4. And let's read one verse here in chapter 4, verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Kepha, Peter, and Yochanan, John, and they figured out they were laymen without training, they were amazed. And they began to realize that these men had been with Yeshua. To simply be with Yeshua is our first and foremost calling every single day. For without Him, what? We can do nothing. To be with Yeshua, my friends, that is the difference maker. To be with Him, to fellowship with Him. Yeshua is the fountainhead of living waters. He is the bread of life. And in Him we live. In Him we move. In Him we have our being. Nothing we can do for God can take the place of simply being with the Lord. We're living in an age, aren't we, of Martha, of distraction, and not Miriam, who sat at Yeshua's feet. Those who oppose the Shalachim here realized that they had been with Yeshua. They were being trained by the Messiah. Number two, not only did the Shalachim spend time with the Messiah, Yeshua, guess what? He rubbed off on them. His fragrance did anyway, as it were. They became like him. And we are to be this fragrance of Messiah in every place that we go. You know, when somebody wears perfume or cologne, we can smell the fragrance when they enter a room. And likewise, when you and I put on Messiah, people perceive his fragrance in our lives. How many of you know they are attracted to that fragrance in our lives? In fact, that's one of the greatest purposes of the Lord in our lives, to be conformed to the image of his son, to be like him. What fragrance did our predecessors wear they wore, in verse 13, boldness. They wore confidence out of real knowledge that Yeshua indeed is the Messiah. They didn't back down. We must not back down either. They were not ashamed and neither are we. They understood that the fear of man brings a snare. They were not looking for the approval of the Jewish religious leaders. They were looking for repentance. My friends, our boldness today should not be confused with brashness. How many of you know what that is? Rude and overbearing attitudes born out of pride. Yeshua is, as we sung, he's both the lion and the lamb, isn't he? So the fragrance we bear, on the one hand, is the gentleness, the meekness of Yeshua. On the other hand, we bear the boldness of the line of Judah. Finally, number three, why these sessions are so important Beginning August 30th on Tuesday night, after the Shalachim here were threatened in Acts chapter 4. Look how they prayed with me. Verse 29. And now, Lord, look at their threats and grant your servants to speak your word with utmost courage while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Yeshua. What did they do? Very simple. They made themselves available to him. Lord, here we are. They were praying, Lord, here we are. Use us, Lord. Use us to preach. Use us to heal. Use us to do signs and wonders. You're the potter, Lord. We're just the clay. That's what they pray. They wanted to be those vessels of gold, silver, and precious stone. They wanted to be vessels for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. They made, very simply, they just made themselves available to God. And they emptied themselves of themselves. And they said, Hineni shlachani. Here we are, Lord. Send me. And what happened when they made themselves available for God? God brought about all that the prophets had spoken hundreds of years before. The outpouring of revival. Jewish revival. I believe God will do that for us in our generation as well. So, if we're to become effective believers, effective laborers, and effective leaders in this end time harvest, we simply 
just need to follow the pattern of our predecessors, the Shilichim. They were with him, they became like him, and they made themselves available to him on a daily basis. That's my heart in our upcoming set of meetings on Tuesday nights. They're going to be centered on best practices of leadership. We're going to go deep, and so I hope that you can come out and be with us, and we'll finish it off each Tuesday night with prayer. I wanted to, at this time, introduce some special guests. Many of you don't know, back in 2000, I was feeling a burden from the Lord to plant a Messianic synagogue in Phoenix. And we did so. But we've never shared who the leaders have been over the last 22 years. No, I can't. I'm just joking around with you. We have the leaders here from Tree of Life Messianic Congregation in Scottsdale. Rabbi Jack Zimmerman was born and raised in Brooklyn in a Jewish home. He earned his bachelor's degree in radio and television broadcasting and journalism from Brooklyn College, worked for years in radio and television. In 1987, his Jewish mother introduced him to his wife, now wife Sandy. She turned out to be a practicing Christian and showed Jack messianic prophecies in his own Jewish Bible that described Yeshua. And after wrestling with the gospel, Jack finally embraced Yeshua as his Messiah in 1988. The Zimmermans then moved to Phoenix and they found a Tree of Life congregation in the year 2000. Jack serves on the staff as the staff evangelist for Jewish Voice Ministries International. How many of you have heard of Jewish Voice? Yes. He speaks at conferences worldwide. He spoke at our sister synagogue this morning, speaking at the church tomorrow morning. Rebbe says, Sandy Zimmerman, born in Philadelphia in, in a practicing Christian home. Growing up, she attended a Bible-believing congregation that professed love for Israel and the love for the Jewish people. And in her 20s, though, she struggled as a single mom, but built up a very successful mortgage business. After marrying Jack and leading him to Yeshua, the couple felt called to ministry in 1997. She partnered with him to help establish and they lead Tree of Life congregation. Now, they led Tree of Life until 2019, believing it was time for them to retire. Don't you know there's no retirement in the Messianic movement? Come on. God, he does, and he called them back into congregational ministry in 2022. They returned to continue leading the community. They've served in Messianic Jewish work for over 26 years, seeking to reach our Jewish people for the Messiah, Yeshua, and to teach the church about the Hebraic roots of our faith. They have three children, Jordan, Ryan, and Casey, two grandsons, Avriel, Leovani. And if you would welcome them to the platform, I wanted them to introduce themselves and to give you just an encouraging word tonight. I, re I remember calling you, Rabbi Joel, I remember calling you, um, Jack and I called you, because when we first started out in 2000, we were Beth Simcha HaMashiach, which was a lot for people to say, and people were just butchering the name all the time. So when we moved into Scottsdale, and we were surrounded by six synagogues and a lot of churches, and a lot of mixed marriages, Jewish and Christian, like, together. And um, so we started getting, so we, we asked each other, and we prayed, and we asked our staff, we need to change our name because people are not getting it. And so we prayed, and we asked the Lord, and the Lord actually gave us Tree of Life because it speaks to both the Jewish community and the Christian community, because they understand that. So when we were talking about it, I looked at Jack and I went, you need to call Joel, get permission to do that, because I'm just saying. <laughs> do you remember that? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we went forward, and, you know, you're talking about retirement. God has a sense of humor. I was really enjoying my retirement, because <laughs> I've become a grandmother of uh, two beautiful baby boys, Avi, Avriel, and Leovani, Leo. And there's another one coming, and it's a boy. So, <laughs> and his name is going to be Elizo Ben Zion. So they're going to call him Eli. Anyway, um, Darcy and Joel have been amazing friends for a long time. We don't see each other enough, but uh, we do rely on your counsel. And I'm just really proud of you guys. I've you know, seen you... And you are head honcho now. I mean, it's just like, wow. But we love you guys very much. And um, coming back <laughs> coming back out of retirement <laughs> and back into the MJA, MJA is just honoring. It's amazing. So 
Thank you, guys. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sweetheart. Shabbat shalom, tree of life. I was absolutely, we were absolutely honored when we were asked to bring the greeting, and we reminded several times uh, over the weekend that since we are from Phoenix, that apparently we've also brought the heat. Uh, in fact, the folks that we were staying with said, you know, this is probably one of the hottest weekends we've ever had. So, Jack and Sandy, thanks. Although to us, it's beautiful. Amen. This is wonderful. In fact, we're freezing cold, and after the service is over, we're going to Walmart to pick up a couple of parkas. So, pray for us. <laughs> what you're doing here, there are two things that I want to let you know. Uh, first of all, you have the incredible blessing of not just having a rabbi and a rebbitzin over you as shepherds, but ones who know how to passionately love you and show the love of Yeshua. It is the most beautiful thing. It is not as common, perhaps, as we would want it to be, but it's exemplified in, in, uh, in Joel and Darcy. And so we just praise God for that. And I just want to remind you of that. Second, isn't it wonderful how the Messianic movement can come together often? times here in, in the San Diego area, maybe you think, you know, we've got this expression going on, and we wonder, does, does anybody else here know what we're doing? And the whole world knows what you're doing, because even though we are one here, we are one like an echad, one in unity with a worldwide movement of so many who, who symbolically and spiritually are locking arms with you. Closing thought, <clears throat> we're reminded that one day, all of us will worship him on his holy mountain. And I wonder if before we get to his holy mountain, I'll bet many people will be coming from all over saying, wow, you were a part of this and I was a part of this as well. And now we all get to come together and worship him. And so what we have here is a wonderful and beautiful rehearsal. Continue to enjoy it and continue to be loved by those who very much love you. And God bless you. We're so welcome and thankful to be here joining you tonight at service. Shabbat Shalom. Amen. Thank you. If you're in the Phoenix area, we want to want you to check out Tree of Life. They're a recent new member of the IAMCS, by the way. So we're excited about the Zimmermans and what God's doing in Phoenix. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You found your Bibles yet? Not yet. Go with me to the book of Psalms tonight. Summertime in the Psalms is our series. And we've been having a good time. Tonight, we're going to begin in Psalm 23, a psalm that nobody's ever read in their lives, ever, never heard of. Just probably skip over it in your Bibles. You've never read it. But I want to talk about contentment tonight for a few minutes. You would think that as Americans, of all, of all people, with so many material comforts that we have and the high standard of living, that we would be content. But our discontent tips its hand in our constant striving after more things, in our living on credit, in our insatiable lust for gadgets. David Berger and I are going to go to Costco. I'm going to get myself a new TV tomorrow. I have to have it. The TV's on the blink. But I was thinking about it tonight. I'm still going to get it, but we have an insatiable lust for gadgets. <laughs> and in widespread restlessness. In addition to all, to add to this discontent, we have witnessed unprecedented numbers flocking to psychotherapists, reading self-help books to promise, that promise to sort out all of the inner turmoil in our lives, stemming from maybe a difficult past. This is not just an issue for non-believers, my friends, but for Yeshua followers as well. But the scripture says that Adonai has provided us with everything pertaining to life and godliness, right? Yep. And we're to be content with his provision. Psalm 23 is the psalm of a contented heart. In it, David, the shepherd king, shows us that contentment comes from experiencing all that our good shepherd has provided for us. The 23rd Psalm is probably the most beloved text of the entire Bible in our English-speaking world. It is cited 
or heard not only as part of hymns, it's in liturgies, it's in sermons, but also it's been found in movie scripts, right? Symphonies even, and popular songs. A couple of years ago, Bible Gateway published a list of the top 10 searched for Bible verses on their website. Did you know five of the 10 verses that were searched for are from Psalm 23? And I'm certain that people around the world have turned to this psalm over the past two and a half years as we, as we have all been facing global crises, plural, and deep uncertainty about the future. In this psalm, David compares his relationship to the Lord with that of a contented sheep with its caring shepherd. It was a familiar analogy in David's time. I know there are some here that have a lot of experience. I don't know if Barbara's here or not. Is she here tonight? She's out there. Yeah, she, she's, she has a lot of sheep. She had a lot of sheep. But personally, the only time that I've been around sheep is when I've gone to the San Diego Zoo and pet them for a few minutes. And also, though, a decade ago for a few hours, guys, you can put that picture up. I was on a farm in northern Israel, and that was a few hours with some sheep. So I don't have a lot of experience, but I've done a lot of reading to help me craft this message on this psalm, notably sections from the classic Philip Keller's 1970 classic, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is a spiritual history of the Yeshua follower, of us, describing the steps to experiencing the contentment that comes from Adonai's provision in the Messiah Yeshua, our good shepherd. If you're taking some notes, step number one, there are some steps here to experiencing contentment. Number one, the first step is to make the Lord your shepherd. Look with me, verse 1, Psalms chapter 23. A psalm of David, Adonai is my shepherd. I shall not want. Why do you and I turn to Psalm 23 in times of crises? I think it's because of this. I think it's because of the first person singular pronouns here. I, me, mine. In other words, King David did not write, Adonai is a shepherd. Adonai is this shepherd. Adonai is our shepherd. Instead, the very first verse begins with this powerful affirmation. Adonai is my shepherd. You see, it's one thing to know that Adonai is a good shepherd in general. It's another thing to entirely know that he is my good shepherd. He's your good shepherd. Adonai doesn't merely care about Israel or about the world as a whole. Psalm 23 reminds us that he also knows and he cares about me. He cares about you specifically. My friends, if Adonai is your shepherd tonight, then you can trust him. And he sees you and he cares about you on a personal level. He knows your name. And he knows all that you need. Can you believe that tonight? If you feel alone tonight, maybe you're feeling afraid or what tomorrow holds. He sees you tonight and he cares about you. If you're sick tonight, if you're maybe watching and you're in pain, I know there's plenty of that going around. Adonai is concerned about you. And ultimately, how many of you know God wants to lead you into a very good place <laughs> where your future is secure and you have all that you need and more. In addition, I think the key in verse 1 to not wanting, again, is to have the Lord as your shepherd. I think, I think it's very significant that Psalm 23 follows Psalm 22 that we looked at last Shabbat. In Psalm 22 last Shabbat, we saw that the Messiah was forsaken of Adonai as he bore our sin on the tree of sacrifice. It's only after we read that in Psalm 22... That Adonai is my shepherd. We must believe and we must trust in Adonai's son as our sacrificial substitute who died on the execution stake for our sins before we can know him as the good shepherd who meets our every single need. In other words, without Psalm 22, there can be no Psalm 23. My friends, if you know the suffering servant of Messiah in Psalm 22 by trusting him, via his death on the tree, 
and you're seeking to follow him, you and I can say like David says here, the Lord, the covenant-keeping, faithful God, is my personal shepherd. I see a couple of truths presented here. Number one, I see the depth of God's love for his children here causes God to protect, to guide, and to be near to each one of us, just as a good shepherd does for his own sheep. As believers, how many of you know we are the Lord's sheep? We belong to him. We receive his special affection and attention. And we respond to his voice. And we follow him as his sheep. And so to summarize, step number one to contentment is to know that the Lord Yeshua is your personal shepherd. We want to be content. Step number two to contentment is to know and enjoy the good shepherd's gracious provisions. Look with me, verse 2. He makes me what? Lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's name's sake. God has granted again to us everything that pertains to life and godliness. But many followers of Yeshua today are not content. Why? Because they don't know what God has provided supernaturally and abundantly for them. David mentions several things that God has provided. It's a good reminder for us. Look with me. Number one, the good shepherd provides spiritual food, doesn't he? He makes me lie down in green pastures. How many of you know if you're watering every other day now, your lawns are not looking as green as they had been? Sheep grazed on the fertile grass produced by rain in the days of Israel, in the days of these scriptures. Sheep, how many of you know, will not lie down until they've eaten enough. And because of the protective presence and nearness of the shepherd, they can do so in peace And be free from all fear. That's how a sheep rolls. Then they will contently lie down to, to chew their cud. Confidence and shalom, peaceful rest, will be in, quote, green pastures. That's a figure of speech for what makes you and I grow. What makes you and I thrive in Yeshua. Green pastures. My friends, God's word is the full banquet he has provided for his sheep. For us to grow and thrive in life. This is probably the main reason why we lack contentment. I think we don't consistently feed on God's word. Instead, too often, and I'm preaching to myself tonight, we fill our minds with poisonous weeds. What are those? Too much television, bad movies, daily news, and then we wonder why we're stressed out and we're anxious and we're full and we're troubled. God's word has milk for the baby and the Messiah, and he has meat for the more mature. If we would feed on it daily, if we would chew on it as a sheep chews its cud, we would find contentment in Messiah himself. So point number one is the good shepherd provides us some spiritual food. But the good shepherd provides other things as well. Spiritual drink that we just read in these verses, doesn't he? He leads me, what? Besides still waters. That is, waters by which the flock may rest because their thirst has been quenched. Waters which are not turbulent. Waters which hence are then easy to drink from. You see, a sheep, it's a crazy word, isn't it? It's a singular and it's a plural. Sheep. Singular and plural. Isn't that crazy? Anyway. A sheep cannot be content if it is thirsty. But sometimes stubborn sheep will not wait for the clear, pure water that the shepherd is leading them to. And again, Barbara could probably tell you this more than anybody. They stop to drink from the polluted potholes along the trails, contaminated with manure and the urine of previous flocks. Now, it satisfies their thirst for the moment, but what happens eventually is they get riddled with parasites and disease. It's the price they pay for instant gratification and not following the shepherd to clear water. Truthfully, some Yeshua followers are like those sheep. They don't want to wait upon the Lord to fulfill their inner longings. They want a quick fix. They want instant happiness. And so they go for the polluted potholes of the world. They shrug and they say, well, what can that hurt? Well, they don't realize that the consequences, just like that sheep developing parasites and disease, The consequences of sin are oftentimes delayed. 
seeds that are sown to the flesh take a while, right, to sprout up. And suddenly then the person finds himself or herself deep in deep trouble and then blames God for their problems. Sometimes we're like that as his sheep. So the good shepherd provides us drink, spiritual food. But look what David says. It provides us, he provides us spiritual restoration, right? He restores my soul. The Hebrew word restore here, shuv, means turning back or refreshing. Perhaps the sheep have strayed off the trail to nibble on some interesting looking plants, not knowing that those plants are poisonous. Or perhaps maybe they've even gotten separated from the flock and a predator is ready to pounce. Sheep can also become, this is interesting, they can become cast where they roll over on their backs and they're not able to right themselves. You know, if you find a sheep in that position, they're going to die unless the shepherd helps them, tips them back upright within just a couple of hours. My friends, when you and I as God's children become discouraged... The good shepherd revives us. He re-energizes us. He restores our souls through his power and his goodness. Isn't that good news? As God's sheep, we can stray from the path that he has called us to walk in. Some enticing diversion from the world or some desire of our old nature lures us to do what? To separate ourselves from the rest of the flock and from the shepherd. The book of Hebrews tells us, do not forsake the episunagogin of yourselves. You hear the word in there. Together. Our enemy is waiting to pick off straying sheep. Hello? And so when you and I start to stray, we're in grave danger and we need restoration. Now, God uses two ways to do that restoration, by the way. He uses his word and he uses people. His word points us, points out the fact we are off the path. We are way off the reservation and what we must do to be restored. That's the function of the word of God. In addition, God has entrusted to those who are spiritual the ministry of using his word to help restore straying sheep. That is not the fun part of my job, but it is a part of getting us back on the right path. And notice that the good shepherd provides not only spiritual restoration, he provides spiritual guidance as well. Look with me. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We all need guidance with how, how to live in this Meshuggah world. Amen? It's crazy. God's word tells... It, that was the rabbi's phone. Just to let you know, that's the rabbi's phone. God has his ways of humbling us. God's word tells us, go this way. <laughs> Good one. There's always a comedian in the house, isn't there? All the time. I told you, Robert, we're all struggling Jewish comedians, and you're working your material out here, and that was actually pretty good. Let's give him a hand clap. That was pretty good. I like it. God's word tells us, go this way. Don't go that way. God's name is bound up with us as his followers. He's chosen to identify his holy name with us. If we live just like the world, we cause his name to actually be blasphemed. Let's read on. Step number three. If we want to be content... We're to walk with the good shepherd through the hard times. Verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Walking with the good shepherd through the tough times in life. The good shepherd does not provide contentment by keeping his flock from trials. Hello? But rather by providing, it says here, his presence in the midst of trials. It's worth noting that in verses 1, 2, and 3, David uses the third person, he, to refer to the Lord. But when he speaks about times of trial here in verses 4 and 5, David shifts to the more intimate second person, the you 
pronoun. In a time of trial, we need to draw closer in fellowship with the good shepherd. We don't want to pull away from him in times of trial. We don't want to do that in anger or hurt. That's not the way to go, folks. These types of tri- There are three types of trials that David's talking about here, and they finish, they fulfill the trials that we experience all the time. Trials of fear, right? The valley of the shadow of death. You see, sometimes the shepherd has to lead his sheep through some very dark valleys. There are dangers involved. The Hebrew in verse 4 does not necessarily point to mavet, to death, although that could be involved here. Rather, he's pointing to a fearful place of extreme danger and darkness. You see, sometimes we as Yeshua followers, we express a desire, man, to walk on a higher plane in the messianic life and the experience. But we often mistake, we mistakenly think that God airlifts his flock to that place. He doesn't do that. No, the only way to higher ground is to walk with the good shepherd through some very scary and fearful valleys where we might despair even at times of life itself. Have any of you ever been in that place and are willing to admit that? The shepherd's presence. There are two things that give contentment to the sheep when they walk through this very dangerous valley of fear. The shepherd's presence... And the shepherd's rod and staff, David says here. The rod, it's like a short club. It was a symbol of authority to ward off predators, to discipline wayward sheep. It's a comfort to know that God is in charge and to be subject to his authority in times of fear. Now the staff, if you've ever seen a staff, that long slender stick with a hook on one end of it was a symbol of concern used to draw the sheep close to the shepherd, to guide them on the right path or renew or rescue it from trouble. The sheep would be comforted in the rod. They would be comforted in, in, with the staff, knowing that they were, those two items would be used for their benefit, even if it might hurt at times. Trials of conflict, it says, in the presence of of my enemies. The scripture is clear. The messianic life is not free from conflict. Have you noticed? (laughs) Looking back at the end of his life, Rabbi Saul called his ministry a fight. My friends, if you stand for God's word in truth, you are going to have enemies. You're going to have conflict. Nobody Now, there might be a crazy person in here, but nobody likes conflict. I'm not saying you're not born for conflict, but you don't like it. But the good shepherd takes care of his own by preparing a table for us in the presence of our enemies. That's crazy, but I love that promise. And finally, there's also trials, not only of fear and of conflict in our lives. There are trials of irritation. Anointed my head with oil, David writes. Shepherds anointed sheep with oil to heal their wounds and to keep keep the flies and the bugs off them. Sheep cannot lie contently if insects are swarming around their nostrils or their ears or their open wounds. So what would the shepherd do? He would pour oil on those things. My friends, isn't it true that it's the little irritations... I walked into this building tonight. I was ready to preach the word. Hit immediately. Rabbi, we've got no water tonight. And how many of you know I answered that with, just praise the Lord, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> no, I did not do that. You did not see me at 4 to 4.30 today. I was kind of dispatching orders around. We're going to do this, that, and the other. Listen, it's the irritations that rob us of our contentment at times. And to cope with frustrating circumstances and to cope with frustrating people in our lives, we need qualities like love, joy, shalom, patience. We can white out that one. We don't need that one, actually. (laughs) Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Where do these come from? 
Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. In Scripture, oil is a picture of the Ruach. Our Good Shepherd has given us the oil of the Spirit to keep irritations from bugging us, no pun intended. Contentment comes from walking with the good shepherd in trials of fear, in trials of conflict, and of irritation. Step number four is to see God's goodness in every situation, both now and in the future. Final verse, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Adonai forever. Two sheepdogs actually follow God's sheep continually. How many of you know what their names are? Goodness and mercy. You see, the rest of the world pursues goodness and mercy. But we have God's goodness and mercy pursuing us. Remember with Joseph, right? Genesis 37 through 40. We may go through horrible trials like Joseph, which we don't understand at the time. But also, just like Joseph, we can always look back and we can say, like Joseph, quote, Yes, you yourself planned evil against me to his brothers. God planned it for good. I love that. April, if you'd come up tonight, we're going to pass on the next psalm. I feel it's an appropriate way to... Close out tonight with the Good Shepherd staying with us through life's journey. We will receive constant guidance. We will receive his constant help, his constant kindness, his constant support. No matter what happens in our lives, we can trust Adonai to work for our good in all situations, in all circumstances. In our future, by the way, how many of you know, it is secure. The world doesn't want you to know that. We will always be in God's fold in this life and in eternity. He loves us. He cares for us so much. We're the most blessed sheep on the planet. So why are we going elsewhere? The thought in the phrase, dwell in the house of the Lord forever, is that of actual fellowship with Adonai as a member of his household. Rav Shaul put it like this, though the world counts us as sheep for the slaughter, quote, we are, woo, come on somebody, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So as we wrap up this psalm, let me just ask us a few questions tonight. Are we a contented sheep tonight in Adonai's pasture? Do we walk every day in the conscious joy of all the spiritual riches that are ours in Messiah? Or could it be, probably, that we've gotten a little bit caught up in the world. We've got a little bit caught up in the pleasures of the world. We complain and we gripe a lot. I know that's part of a Jewish DNA strand to complain, but we're not to remain there. I got so doggone upset and angry watching Trump get his Mar-a-Lago getting raided. I, I felt like I was getting out of the spirit. Letting the world kind of wash over me. We're actually lacking the contentment he wants us to have. Real contentment comes, if you'd stand with me tonight, from experiencing all that the Good Shepherd has provided for us. It is available to us. In the Messiah Yeshua for every one of his sheep. Let's not miss it. As we've experienced restful Shabbat today, we love to sing a song here to move us into that time of Havdalah. And then we're going to have a wonderful feast that Victor and his team have been preparing on the patios outside. So let's sing this out. Behold, God is our salvation. Behold, God is our salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord my God is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. For the Lord my God is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Lie, 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 lie.
Hallelujah. You may be seated for a minute. April, if you just stay up and noodle a little, little bit. We, tonight, we actually say farewell to the Sabbath. Yeah, we can give a collective. Oh, all right. <laughs> Through the ceremony of Havdalah or separation. It's therefore a, kind of a melancholy ceremony, but it's optimistic as well. Saddened by the passing of Shabbat, we look forward to a time when every day can be as holy and special as Shabbat. And so Havdalah recognizes the separation of the, of the peace of Shabbat and then the rush of the ongoing week. We greet one another as Shabbat arrived last night with a Shabbat Shalom. And now our final words at Havdalah are our way of speaking forth a blessing over each one here as we say Shavua Tov. May you have a good week. And so our Havdalah set tonight consists of a cup of wine, grape juice in this case, filled and overflowing into a dish. This is a visual sign as we do this of fullness and the, of completion of the week. Also, quote, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood, Yeshua said, likened as a symbol of the joy of the Sabbath rest of the Lord. His word lived out as the water transformed into wine. His word transformed into our joy. And so we have the clay spice box filled with cloves, cinnamon, rosemary, and lavender. This box of spices is to cheer the soul. My soul is cheered. It really is. I'm not thinking about the bathrooms right now. I'm not thinking about the no water in the floor. My soul is cheered. Let's get some of that stuff in our home. Our soul is cheered because Shabbat is departing and should carry us th through the pressures of the week until once again we can celebrate the Shabbat. This can also be viewed that our new covenant lives, our new creation lives, live out consistently before the throne of God is like a sweet-smelling aroma in the nostrils of the Lord as the burnt offering of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, once did. And finally, we have the Havdalah candle. This twisted candle represents light, the first element created by Adonai at the beginning of the first week. And according to the Talmud, the candle must be a torch. And so the candle has more than one wick tonight. We have four wicks on this one. You can get a Havdalah candle that have up to 15 wicks. And the resulting bright ish, bright fire, symbolizes the difference between the spiritual and material worlds. The spiritual world is a world of light. It needs no fire for illumination. And Shabbat can be viewed as the gateway to that spiritual world. But the days of the week are part of the material world, and they need fire for illumination. And thus, the bright fire of this candle recalls the mundane days of the week. And so together as one, we stand here gazing at the blaze of light. In the light of Shabbat, we have learned more of what it is, I hope you have over the last 24 hours, of what it is to love one another. We had an amazing time as men this morning at Victor's home and Sheila's home, and he gave us a devotional out of John chapter 21 of what it is to love one another on the beach eating breakfast with Yeshua, not withholding back, not holding back who we are from one another. And in so doing, we stand up as one into the fullness of who we are as the body of the Messiah, lifting up the head, the rosh, the light of the world, Yeshua HaMashiach. It is He, my friends, right, that brings the light into the darkness of life. And our prayer is that we might be reminded that we are children of the light. Let us walk in the light as He is in the light. And we also finally have our challah from last night's dinner on Erev Shabbat. And we say, as we have already sung, Hine el Yeshuati, Eftach below Efchad. Behold, God is our salvation. I trust in Him, right? We will not be afraid. Ushaftimayim besoson, mim aine ha Yeshua. With joy we shall draw water from the wells of salvation. Adonai tzvoti manu. Miskavlanu Elohe Yaakov, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. You have saved us, O Lord. You have answered us, O our King, when we called upon you. 
Give us light. Give us joy. Give us gladness. Give us honor, even as then the happiest days of Israel's past. And we will therefore with joy abundantly lift up the cup of Yeshua to rejoice in your redeeming power and call out your name in praise. Hallelujah. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech alam. Borei peri hagafen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, Woo! who has brought forth the fruit of the vine in Yeshua's name. We say, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech alam. Borei menei. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, creator of the universe, who brings forth and creates the spices. And finally, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, king of the universe, who brings forth grain from the earth. We give thanks for the Sabbath day, for it is now ended in another hour and a half or so. We're so grateful for its many blessings. Blessed is the Lord our God, King of the universe, who separates sacred from profane, light from darkness, the seventh day from rest, from the six days of labor, and as your body of believers from the world of sin and corruption by Yeshua's redemptive work. Blessed is the Lord who separates the sacred from the profane. I'm going to ask our guests to come forward tonight we are going to do that, yes, and we're going to kind of be sad for that. Thank you. When the Zimmermans and I, and Darcy and I, traveled with them to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, that was a tough ministry assignment, Puerto Vallarta. <laughs> Actually, I was on one of those trips where I got caught in the elevator. And it was like 110 degrees, and I thought, this is how I go. I'm done. I remember that. Oh my gosh. Nobody was answering the call from the elevator, and I was probably in there 15 minutes. And I thought, I am done. I am cooked, literally. <laughs> and then that night, it came out, and we had our service. Praise the Lord. He got me out of there. And Rabbi Jack gave the ironic blessing, and it just did my soul so much good for that time. And I wanted us to receive God's blessing from Rabbi Jack tonight. From the Lord's, the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, it's on. It should be on. Praise the Lord. Would you all please rise if you're able? I will pronounce this blessing over us first in English and second in what we call la lengua de los cielos, Espanol. And then third, I will sing it over us in the Hebrew. And to each and every one who's come tonight, whether you are here live or watching us on the internet, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he grant you his peace. El Señor te bendiga y te guarde. El Señor haga resplandecer su rostro sobre ti y tenga de ti misericordia. El Señor alce sobre ti su rostro y le ponga en ti paz. Yivorechecho Adonai Veyishmarecho Yaher Adonai Pono velecho veyechunecho he saw Adonai Pono Velecho Via Sehem Licho Shalom. And all of God's people said, Shabbat shalom. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat outside on the patios. Some excellent dinner tonight. I hope you brought your appetites physically as well. You can enter, exit out of those doors. We'll see you outside. <laughs>